Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. It is a big honor for me to introduce Francis Kisling. Let me tell you who Francis Kisling is. Francis is, is one of the most influential activists, one of the most influential feminists, I would say, in, in the fields of religion, reproduction, and women's rights. Francis has been dubbed the philosopher of the pro-choice movement by the, the Boston Globe. <clears throat> she is the president of the Center for Health, Ethics, and Social Policy. In 1977, she was appointed founding president of the National Abortion Federation. In 1987, she co-founded uh, the Global Fund for Women. She was president of Catholics for Choice from 1982 until 2007. She has been a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University, visiting scholar at the Center for Bioethics at the University of Pennsylvania, and currently visiting scholar at the at this institute, the Instituto de Investigaciones Filosóficas de la UNAM. Uh, she has consulted widely with European and Latin American parliaments and worked extensively on ethics and values with NGOs throughout the Global South. Frances Kiesling has published more than, than 200 articles in international journals, magazines, and newspapers, including the International Journal of Gynecology and Obstetrics, Reproductive Health Matters, Journal of Medical Ethics, The Lancet, the Journal of Feminist Studies and Religion, the Guardian, The Nation, and the New York Times, among others. She is currently writing a book on population ethics with Peter Singer and Alex Hesse. Well, Francis, thank you very much for, for being with us today. Yeah, and, and especially in, in this day, just one day after the, the decriminalization of abortion in, in Mexico. Yeah, some people in the States are, are saying, well, this is, uh, Mexico's Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I'm sure someone who has worked so much as, as you have done for the decriminalization of abortion in the United States, but also here in Mexico, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. knows of the significance of, of this event. Yeah. And well, with no further ado, I I let you give your talk. Thank you. Okay, before I really start on this, let me just say a few introductory remarks and thank you to all of you for attending this lecture. Um, special thank you to Gustavo, of course, and not just for arranging for this lecture, but for uh, the affiliation with the Institute. It has been a pleasure. Uh, to to work with um, those of you in the institute that I have worked with, and uh, and to teach it, it I I like teaching and I have very much enjoyed the courses that I have given here. Um, we have had a very good relationship um, in terms of my participation. Our the the, uh, the work has taken Gustavo and me and several other people. Um, outside of Mexico, as well as working in Mexico, we participated jointly in a um, important UN meeting on family planning in Kenya, and we have visited with uh, Princeton at Princeton University in the Center for Human Values with Peter Singer, and also met with other bioethicists in New York. So um, it it has been very, very, it's been a lot of fun, and I think we've all learned a lot from it. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is a research project that I have been working on for about two years now. And um, I have two colleagues in this project that I would like to acknowledge. One is Sara Symes, who formerly worked at the Hewlett Foundation and was also the executive director of something called the Alan Guttmacher Institute. Sarah has a lot of experience in monitoring and evaluation um, and works extensively with a number of the European government agencies who fund issues related to um, reproductive health and gender. 
Um, another colleague that has worked with us is a uh, recent postgrad fellow from Princeton, Kian Mintz Wu. Uh, Kian is a philosopher who specializes in the area of the environment, and he is currently teaching at the University of Cork in Ireland. One of our goals with this project is to do a number of case studies that will help people in the field of philanthropy and also social transformation to, to take a look at different ways of looking at this, at this issue. So we, we, Sarah Symes and I were the originators of the project. We had been talking for a long time as have many people, both in the foundation world and in the um, NGO world, where the NGOs are concerned with social transformation. And uh, what we have noticed, had noticed, is that um, new perspectives on impact, monitoring, so effective altruism, um, how we're having a what we saw as a negative effect on the ability of organizations working on social transformation to both to frame their work in ways that acknowledge this new emphasis on impact. And that emphasis includes a very strong belief in um, quantitative measures of evaluation. It is very hard and it works well. It's a, it's a good thing that both organizations and donors think about whether what they are doing and what they are funding has impact. But there are different kinds of impact and the current trend is impact primarily in the quantitative mode. If you can't prove that you have saved a large number of lives, you have a hard time getting the attention of certain donors. Um, the idea of impact evaluation is not new, but it gained impetus for, I would say, from, from three groups who came into the philanthropic field over the last 15 years. The first groups that came into the field that are new are individual, largely individual, high net worth donors who made a lot of money on the stock market. And many of them wanted to do giving. And they had a belief that since they knew how to pick the kinds of organizations to invest money in, they knew how to pick the kind of organizations that investing their money in would benefit from those resources and would, instead of generating profit for a, st for a stockholder, would generate profit in the form of helping the groups and issues on which they chose to fund. And the stock market has a very well-developed process where brokers know what to, what to spend money on. Um, so that was one group. The other group was similar in a sense because they were mostly individual donors. And that was the enormous wealth that has come out of the tech industry, particularly in California. Some of those people we know very well, at least we know their names. We know that, you know, Gates, of course, we, we know um, the others, we know Chan and Zuckerberg. Um, and any number of others who are less well-known individually, but control enormous wealth. And they too were looking to invest 
in charitable enterprises of various types. And they also found that the kind of information that they would get when they talked to people who were doing this work, um, particularly those, again, who are working in areas that are non-quantifiable, cannot be measured quantifiably, that they weren't getting the, the information they wanted. I mean, these, they, you know, their approach was, these people don't know what they're doing. And we know what they're doing, and we know what success looks like. And then the third entry in this, which has um, taken more prominence in the last decade, are those uh, people who got into giving um, through the right, initially through the writings of Peter Singer on effective giving and the moral obligation to give, and the organizations that developed alongside of and in response to what Peter has written. Um, and so we have a slew of organizations, mostly financed by wealthy individuals. Some have money from foundations. And those organizations, like you may know some of them, Giving What We Can, give are, some of them are based at Oxford and come out of the philosophical world. And some of them are based mostly, again, on the West Coast of the United States and are based upon this influx of wealth that was not or had not yet figured out how they wanted to do giving. And as I say, our concern, Sara's and my concern, was what we were seeing was that organizations that are working on um, civil transformation within societies, democracy, uh, LGBTQ issues with sex workers, even on in the area of reproductive rights, which is uh, a quantify or reproductive health, which is a quantifiable, um, were losing some of their donors. And as someone who comes out of that community, I would say, um, had actually not figured out how to convince donors to give them money, new donors to give them money. And so Sara and I, I had been talking with Sara about things that I've been doing in the area of ethics. And um, she more strongly than I believed that it was perfectly possible that we could develop a different kind of framework for assessing progress towards social transformation than the logical frameworks employed by many of these groups we mentioned and extensively employed by European governments. And if anyone has ever sought a grant from a European government, you have some idea of what they want to know and what they consider to be success. And so we began with this idea that maybe we could develop a monitoring and evaluation process that relied more heavily on ethics and that's and so we've been working we, we we've been in a hiatus now we've been finished a first round of about 40 interviews you know sort of semi-structured interviews with people in the field and um, we learned a lot we've changed some of our thinking which to me is always a sign that you might be work going in the right direction um, and uh, now we are in the process of thinking about where do we take, what did we learn, where do we take this, and what do we do with it? What do we do with it now? And so I hope that to hear a lot from you in terms of ideas about does this idea of an ethical framework for assessing progress make any sense at all? Everyone we have interviewed loves it. They, they think it's just wonderful. But then they say, what does it mean? <laughs> really? I mean, what are you going to do with this? How are we going to do it? Kind of thing. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're struggling with a lot of that stuff. So um, could we see the next slide? Let's see. I'm going to go into some slides now. Not a slide. I think you have to do it, Gustavo. Okay. First, I want to say something about the Berg Gruen Prize. I don't know if those of you in Mexico are aware of this. 
But this is a million dollar a year prize from Mr. Berggruen um, to an individual who has made an outstanding contribution to philosophy and culture. It's only been around since 2016. And so far, the prize, the prize this year was given to Peter Singer. Um, in previous years, it was given to Martha Nussbaum, Paul Farmer, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Honora Sylvia O'Neill, and Charles Taylor. Um, and it is within the philosophical community, it is something people pay attention to. I mean, everybody would like to get a Burger Gruen prize. <laughs> and most of us, many of us have been putting our hands on our hips since 2016 and saying, when is Peter going to get this prize? Because he certainly is an important person in the field. Um, Peter has decided what to do with the money and he's giving it all away. Okay. And he has a very nice article it, which explains what he is giving it to. And um, I'm mentioning Peter because his, his association with effective altruism um, has very much influenced what we are doing. And um, he, he, he has made an, a very important contribution around the way some people think about their obligation to give. All right. Um, he's, give, he's giving 50% of it to the life you can save, which is his own foundation, which funds primarily in the area of poverty reduction. He's giving about 30% of it to animal rights. Those are two, I think, highly predictable things that Peter would do with such money. And the remaining 20% he hasn't decided what to do with. And if you have any good ideas, he invites you to let him know what your good ideas are. I have a few good ideas. And one of the ideas that I am interested in is um, to move some of this philosophical money to the global south. That all of the people who have been given the prize up to now are northerners. And that that beginning to support the work of philosophers and philosophic institutions in the global south with small startup money, which is all Peter is going to have less after he gives 70% of it to poverty and animals, um, would be a good thing to do. So I'm going to recommend that to Peter. And of course, you may have your own ideas, but I am ultimately an advocate. And therefore, I want you to know what I'm going to recommend, because maybe you'll recommend the same thing. All right. So now let's go to the next slide. Okay, here's, here's, I'm going to start in a sense with effective altruism and the ideas behind that. Um, but we're not going to stay with this for more than a slide or two. So here's basically what Peter has said in famine, affluence, and morality, which in a certain sense, in my opinion, was written in 672 after, after the 71, what was then East Bengal famine, um, is one of the, is at least from a philosophical point of view, one of the well, most well thought out arguments for giving and giving effectively. One of the things that we are dealing with as well in this um, work that we are doing is language. What do these words mean that are used consistently in the philanthropic field and in the NGO organization? And do they have any meaning? Is the meaning clear and constant? What does it mean to be effective? for example, what does it mean to give? Um, so this is what Peter has said. And basically he says, if it is in our power that we can prevent something bad from happening, then, and, and doing that 
really doesn't cost us anything of near equal value on the bad scale to the good that can be accomplished by doing this. We have a moral obligation to do this. Okay. And again, the, all of these expressions require examination. So let's move to the next slide. This is nothing new. Okay. First, I started by saying there's all this new stuff with all these new entrepreneurs and everything else about effectiveness, etc. In fact, when you look at the current set of, organ of donor organizations that operate and that are concerned with effectivity and impact, there are a ton of them. Every, you know, dozens of universities in the States have established centers for philanthropy and teach philanthropy. Um, independent organizations have grown up like Impact Poverty, Poverty Action, Impact Matters, etc. These groups have primarily focused on random controlled trials as the best measure of effectiveness. Many groups that I've worked with don't have a nickel to spend on a random controlled trial. And most likely they wouldn't, they, they, they wouldn't get what they want from it because how do you randomize this and how do you control it? And then we have a whole other group within the donor community. Um, the Hewlett Foundation has an excellent program in effective philanthropy with a large staff for it. There are commercial companies like Bridgespan um, and, and the, we have a Center for Effective Philanthropy, which has been around for a very long time and spends a lot of time evaluating philanthropy, not evaluating the people philanthropy gives money to. So the field is not a brand new field, but for, I would say two reasons, the emphasis on, well, maybe one reason, the emphasis on impact has increased dramatically. Those reasons have to do with the economic markets. As foundations have lost money in the market during the several depressions from the 1980s forward, they have said to themselves, we have to take a look at who we're giving money to. Okay. Because we're losing money and we can't give as much money as we're giving and we can't give to as many people. So we have to figure out how to be more effective. And that has influenced the drive towards giving to organizations um, where as a kind of straight, maybe qu little quadrado person, you want to know what's happening with your money and you have a board of directors you have to satisfy. So that has been a very big influence in this area. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. So what we're dealing with to some extent is the question of how do you know if you're having an impact, particularly if you are working on things that are not measurable in a logical framework. Okay. And we're looking at two things in my project. We're looking at both organizations and money. The money is sort of the sexy part of it because everybody likes to talk about money, but almost as much as they like to talk about sex, but not quite. Um, but organizations have the same obligation that a donor has. If we are saying that a donor has a moral obligation to give money effectively and to study and figure out what is most effective, well, an organization has the same obligation. Organizations, ca the capital of the organization, besides their money, is what they do. Are they doing anything that is effective? How do they know if their goal is, for example, to uh, 
change the cultural and legal framework for democracy in a given country? What are the measures? This is very hard. And sometimes when things are very hard, a complacency does set in and you just sort of think you're accomplishing good things. We can hear this often in the language of groups. The current wisdom, as we know, is monitoring and evaluation. Fund the things that can be measured. And perhaps even some organizations who, are, who have very large social transformation goals need to cut back to more quantifiable goals. Okay. This sometimes leads to social change organizations thinking about activities rather than effectiveness. We were in the newspaper 500 times last year. This is twice as many times as we were in the newspaper a year, two years ago, et cetera, et cetera. We held workshops in 50 rural communities, okay, on women's rights. This doesn't tell an impact-oriented donor, nor does it necessarily inspire your own staff that you are being effective but you don't have a better methodology. And so what we're interested in is what about that which cannot be measured? There's a book called The Goldilocks Challenge by Dean Carlin. Dean Carlin is one of the key experts on effectiveness. And, what De and Dean attempts to deal with this problem. And basically what he says, and we interviewed him, he says, look, these things can't be measured and stop trying to force organizations to measure them. Accept, accept activity indicators as sufficient. Another element of this dilemma between that which is very effective and easily quantified and that which isn't is the question of whether how you accomplish your end matters so and i think for for example those who are in the singer camp although singer is not as heavily in his own camp as he once was which we could talk about that at some point um is that if you're a utilitarian how something gets accomplished is not of big importance I mean, obviously, you don't want to accomplish it by bombing the country, right? Maybe not so obvious, but how you treat your staff, questions of diversity, et cetera, are not so important. So long as you accomplish your goal and you don't do harm. I mean, we do have some principles here. But even do harm is interpreted in different ways. So that those are some of the things that concern us. Next slide. What can't be measured? Social transformation. Back to what I just said before. Should we even try? And then my our thesis, which is that groups work in social transformation are losing funders and, and losing traction. This is not a universal. There are some areas where new funders are coming into the field, but they are not dramatically increasing the pool of resources. And when they are compared with the loss of resources from donors who move to more effective models, we're not doing so well. I'm more familiar with this in, in, in relationship to women's funding, where there have been some US foundations and European donors 
who have given a significant amount of new money. But then there are also examples. For example, um, the Global Fund for Women, which I'm very familiar with, uh, had a donor that was contributing $3 million a year to their education program. The donor became not more knowledgeable about impact funding and decided that the impact from education of children, particularly women, was not sufficient to warrant his giving his money in this area. And so he moved over to malaria. Malaria is a very popular area of safe giving. So anyway, next slide. So the, what is so that's that leads just to what's the project? It's an attempt to develop a qualitative model that uses philosophy and ethical frames for act, accept, no, for for assessing progress in efforts to transform and change the way society functions. Our first instinct, and it is a value-oriented instinct, was you start with asking the people who are doing the work. And so we designed a semi-structured interview form, and we recorded about, about 40 plus interviews with people in several areas. Let's go to those areas. I think that's what I have next. Next slide. Who are the players that we thought were important? First, organizations working on social transformation, human and civil rights, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, sex workers, and democracy work broadly read. The donors, foundations, government, and high net worth individuals, and the experts. Next slide. Organizations, who did we interview? We favor the South, although we're more successful with organizations than we are in other areas. And this is a list of various projects where we have interviewed the people running those projects. Generally speaking, these interviews involve a group of people. I mean, again, it goes with the ethos and the values that we are dealing with, which is that these are mostly organizations that do not have strong, charismatic, individual leaders, which is the model of success of the 60s through the 90s. And then new sets of people came along and worked in these organizations and brought in ideas about how things should be led, how decisions should be make, made, etc. And you see now, in, we see in those organizations, the design, each time we had four or five people that we interviewed within the system. Um, we also did some large global organizations like Amnesty International, and we did some work, this is actually, it goes up in the first column, but it was so long, the name that I put it down here, with the Collective for Research Training on Development, which is based in Lebanon. Um, we wanted a mix of regions, and we wanted a mix of types of organizations. Um, we don't think we're done, because you can see just by looking at this that we haven't hit everybody. Um, okay, next slide. Intermediate donors. We have this group in philanthropy who are intermediate donors. They have to raise the money they give away. And then they give away money. So they, they have a kind of understanding of this tension between who has the money and who needs the money. It's actually very good. We interviewed Amplify Change, which is in the UK, the Global Fund for Children in the US, the Global Fund for Women in Washington, in, no, in, in California, and Semillas, forgive the typo, here in Mexico. <laughs> I did this, I, I, put, I put these slides together this morning. So um, I didn't get to check them as much as I would like. And so we interviewed people from those organizations. Next list. The donors. 
the real money. Okay. Ford, Hewlett, Packard, Give Well Open Philanthropy, which is part of the effective altruism community, but was founded by hedge fund managers from New York. Okay. Open Society Foundations, that's George Soros's uh, set of foundations, which is currently in the process of changing its strategies completely. Uh, I think we are now up to 180 staff members of the Soros Foundations who have taken a buyout, which means they will no longer be employed in the foundation because the work will be managed differently. This itself is an interesting case study um, to look at in terms of what values are preserved and what values may be lost. We also interviewed the IKEA Foundation. Um, we wanted a corporate donor, and the person who runs the IKEA Foundation is a longtime, actually, expert in monitoring, evaluation, learning, and innovation, and someone we trust. And the loudest foundation, which is a company that makes clothes largely in Asia and has a very active program around the issues that we would see as are important from a social transformation perspective. And they have a um, very well developed model of thinking and evaluation. We have, there are some more, this is like, a, you know, like this is probably 75% of what we interviewed. But that was our, that's the basis of our data is both what those people have told us and uh, what we have been able, and the other part of any research project is what we have read. What is the literature that is available on these issues? Two types of literature are available. And I, I think I sent Gustavo um, a list of a literature list that we consider important. One set of literature is in the philosophical realm and thought realm, philosophical and thought realm about these issues. And another set is a very practical set, um, not that philosophy can't be practical, a very practical set of uh, how to do it, you know, different types of metrics. So that's the basis of, of that's what we have and what we've been doing for, for a while now is pouring over this stuff and asking ourselves a lot of questions. And as I say, figuring out what do we do with this material we have? It's very, very rich. Um, there are some people out there who are doing fabulous work in a very progressive framework. There's a woman in India who, um, who, 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 Kriya in India is an organization we studied extensively and Kriya really they know what they're they know what they're doing, and there are others like that who are doing fabulous work. Next, oh, the experts! I forgot about the experts. Okay, we interviewed a lot of experts, and when I look at the list, I get a little disappointed in myself. Okay, most of the experts are from the U.S. Okay, now. I know more people in the U.S. than I know from anywhere else, but that's no excuse. So Dean Carlin, who is, is the guru on random control trials and has been affiliated with all of the groups out of Boston that do this work. Michael Selzer, um, an LGBT activist who is very respected in the um, social transformation community and by donors and advises them and provides kind of the why should you fund social action message. Sheikh Mbake, who um, 
was associated from the Sudan. It was associated for a long time with the Rockefeller Foundation and also has good ideas. Margaret Hempel, a long career at the Ford Foundation and now is a consultant to funders. Barbara Klugman from South Africa, who is, in my opinion, the best consultant on monitoring and evaluation in the world. And then, and Carol Bradford on the bottom, Carol Bradford has um, an extensive 20 um, year history working mostly with DFID on questions around strategy. And then the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, which is the money of a rich individual who made his money in the market in London and who now has a foundation that works very hard on these issues. So next slide. And then in government, we interviewed two people. We interviewed Nadine, who probably many of you know, um, from in Mujeres. And Nadine has a long history and background working with UN agencies, as well as with in Mujeres now, and also was one of the major players in the post Mexico City legalization of abortion and the attempt to move it out into other states. And um, we spoke with two of the people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands, which is looking very closely, as are many of the European donors, um, at what to do in philanthropy and who they give to and how they give in the future. Um, lots of uh, government, it was very difficult to get government officials to buy in to this work. Okay, even to, to, even to be interviewed. Okay, I wanna move forward because I just looked at my clock and now I have to talk about philosophy for a few minutes. Next slide. Okay, what did we learn? And remember what we were presenting to people was the idea of a philosophical ethical framework. All right. The limits of all of our networks, of our networks, of my team, we didn't interview any ethicists or philosophers, and we didn't interview young people. And when I looked at it, I said, wow, why didn't we do that? We have to do something about that. Everyone we did interview was thinking about monitoring and evaluation of the unmeasurable, and nobody was happy with what they have discovered so far. Nobody has found a comfortable place in this arena. The donors haven't found it. The organizations haven't found it. And the experts don't have an answer to this problem of measurement. One of the important things was that the use of language among all of these groups is contradictory in many ways, but especially contradictory when you hear what those who believe in social transformations say they believe and how their operations are organized. Okay, so we hear things like, uh, we want to be transparent, we want to be participatory. Uh, some of the buzzwords now are shift the power. Power in terms of giving has to go from the north to the south. But when we ask people, what do they mean? And what would that look like? There's a lot of uncertainty. To be generous, we are talking about a major transformation of the way organizations look at effectiveness. And they just recently became attracted, became, became bought in to effectiveness equals qualitative impact. 
And so now, anything we do now is another big shift. And I wonder how people will evaluate us in doing this work. But then we, and we hear, for example, um, big thing now in development, decolonized development, okay? Everybody working in the North, who is working in the, not everybody, who's working in the development sector, sees that their work, all of the power is based in the North, in the governments, in the foundations, and it's just another form of colonialism. That's the, that's the result. And of course, we hear words like monitoring, evaluating, learning, and partnership. But does this actually have any real meaning? I mean, for example, one of the interviews I did with one of the groups who calls their grantees partners, very careful to always refer to people they give money to as a partner. I said, what does that mean? In what way are they partners? Why are you calling them partners? And they, you know, they get, there's an embarrassed shrug. Well, they're, it's an aspirational term. They would like this to be more of a partnership, but how do you share power with someone where you decide who gets the money and you decide what priorities are important? Next slide. We learned more things, but that's a quick second. Oh, I do have some more learning. We needed to change our starting point. People want a holistic process. They don't want to start talking about, well, they may not do this. They, it hasn't yet been recognized that monitoring and evaluation is the last step. Even If you even do monitoring and evaluation is the last step in a complex process of building relationships. We also learned that the grantees don't like evaluators from the foundation, from the funder. They want an independent evaluator because, not because they, 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 they don't want to tell the donor what they're doing, but because the donor isn't really all that interested. And this goes to the next thing. When they have an external evaluator, the external evaluator spends meaningful time with them, more often than not, and is not wedded to what the donor wants as the outcome. The current monitoring processes, we were told over and over again, lack integrity. And we were told this by both the funders and the groups, because for the most part, the donors do not have the time or the energy to really give the floor to the people doing the work for open-ended conversations about what they're trying to do, how it's going, where they failed, etc. That the people in the, with the money who talk to the grantees, have a board of directors over them, and they also have an executive team, and the executive team just wants to get on with it. And so the process of negotiation, if there even is one, between the grantee and the donor is, here is what we want you to tell us in your report. And the grantees tell them what they want to be told. It's not totally lying, but it doesn't get to what the grantee would like to tell them about what they are succeeding in. It only comes from what the donor is going to consider important. And when you begin to see all of this stuff, I hope you see what we saw, which is that 
philosophical thought and ethical frameworks and ideas could really contribute to improving these processes. We're still figuring out exactly how, but there is, with, there is very little strategic conversation that is structured in a way where ethics plays a role. I'm gonna do five more minutes and then I'm gonna turn it over. Next slide. Okay, so what, what frameworks have we been looking at? Or what ideas have been looking at? And basically we see three types of ethics at the practical level that could inform both the setting of goals and the way in which you look at progress towards transformation, okay? And, I, and again, I'm tr I try to use language other than monitoring and evaluation, impact, et cetera. Progress towards social transformation. Development ethics, the school of development ethics, which has three core principles in a sense, human rights, social justice, and meeting basic needs. So how do we see those things in how we give money and how we use money? Healthcare ethics, which goes beyond healthcare. I mean, we use it as medical ethics, but really, you know, the principle of do no harm extends far beyond healthcare. The principle of leaving people better off, not just with their illness, but with their lives, you know, idea of beneficence, okay? applies a lot. Respect the autonomy of the people you are working with. Well, that doesn't just apply to healthcare. And do justice. Some of these models obviously overlap. And then we have what I insist on calling feminist care ethics. And I resist every time people tell me just to call it care ethics, because I think it is so tied to feminism that I refuse to give up the few contributions feminists have been allowed to make in philosophy. So at any rate, so again, and we understand that that is a reciprocal model based on relationship, based on accountability, et cetera, et cetera. So next, let's go next, because I know we want to get to you. Next slide. Is there a next slide? Core philosophical principles. Okay. It seems to me that in any strategic planning process where you are going to come out with something that says, this is why we exist, right? This is why we exist. This is our goal. Okay. And this is, and there are certain things that follow from the goals we set. I think this can be, this probably needs some expansion. I think, you know, this is like, I did this, but this is old thinking in a certain way. And my own experience is that, however, my own experience is that both organizations and donors fit into these categories. Okay. Either they are wedded to our goal is to save the most lives from malaria that we can. Our goal is whatever, right? but that's the utilitarian type of goal. We want to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And don't try to tell us what the greatest good for the greatest number of people is, because we know that better than you. And then there are givers who kind of follow a deontological model. This, this is not perfect. This, this is not a perfect match, but, you know, give me some latitude on this. And those are the donors that want to do, basically, they want to follow the rules. Okay. There are a lot of donors like that. I don't want to give to anything risky. I don't want to, I want to see that the laws are followed. It may even include some element of I want to change the laws. Okay. And then there's 
here we're going back to care ethics. Then there's virtue ethics. Okay, now I'm going to say, I don't know if this is going to ring true from the first. The virtue ethicists I see are the people who say the following. I don't really care if we have significant impact. I intend to do the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to fund LGBT work. The right thing to do is to fund family plan. Not because of the good effect it has on anything. It's the right thing to do. And we're going to do the right thing forever. And we're going to do it even if the progress is minimal. Because the process of doing the right thing, we have confidence in. And what is needed if our model becomes better used, the model we are developing, in terms of organizations and donors setting, why are you in business? Why are you in business? And stressing that what you say you are in business to do is what you are going to do. Okay. And how are you going to carry that out? And our role, Sarah's and mine, so far in this is, we are not judging which of these models is better. Some may be better in one way, others may be better in another way. There may be models we haven't figured out yet that philosophers and ethicists can add to this or reframe it for us. But the important thing for us is that you know what you're doing and you know why you are doing it. What's the next slide? I don't even know if I have a next slide. I don't have a next slide. I guess I was right. <laughs> so that's the way we're thinking. And um, we, I want to open the floor to, to hard questions. I do not mind being pushed on things. Um, and um, also ideas, reactions, your knowledge, things you know that I don't know. We can take this wherever it works for you. And I'm turning it back to Gustavo. Okay, thank you very much, Francis. Uh, excellent, we have plenty of time for, for the Q&A. And we have a first question by Abraham Sapien. Hi, hello, thank you. Thanks a lot for your talk. It was very, very interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you something about how you're understanding the concept of Global South and its relation to the Global North, uh, to just kind of clarify, because I think one way to look at it is uh, to see them as in terms of oppression, maybe, or I mean, I'm kind of following uh, Haslanger idea of you have these systematic forms of oppression, right, between two groups, it can be men, women, it could be uh, racial, or it could be maybe in terms of nations or or groups of nations. And I would like to hear more about how you're understanding it, uh, because it, non, it doesn't have to be necessarily a form of oppression between the two, but it could be. Right. And if, it, and if yeah. it was, I'm wondering where the money or where the funding comes from the global north to the global south, um, how to try to prevent that it's not a form of implicit oppression or patronizing or kind of like some institutions telling others what to do implicitly. Mm -hmm. And I think that also depends on how we understand the relationship between those two things, because it doesn't have to be necessarily that right. way. Uh, but I think in the case of Mexico, for example, there's even jokes about it, like, are we North or are we South? Because we are North America, but in many other ways, we speak Spanish like the rest of Latin America. Um, so I would like to hear more about global North uh, notion and how to prevent that kind of like implicit domination when it comes from the global North to the global South, yeah. whoever is which, I mean, I'm not saying which one is which, but I would like to hear more about that. And thanks a lot for your talk. It was very, very it's, 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 You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a very complex question. I mean, but um, many years ago when we were founding the Global Fund for Women, one of our founding board members was a woman named Dame Nita Barrow, who was the 
whatever they called them in those days, whatever the English called them in those days. She was the, the head of Barbados. She was the Commonwealth boss of Bar Barbados. And she was also a woman who came through the World Council of Churches, et cetera, et cetera. And she said to us, as we were thinking about who should we fund, she said, look, there are first world women in the global south. And there are third world women. These are using old languages, of course. Third world women in the global north. And that we, we, we should not make such a tight division between global north, global south, um, et cetera. And so one seeks, but I think that the reality is that we still think, and in the age we live in, which is one of great polarization everywhere, that binary thinking is the dominant thinking. So, so we do think in terms of global south and global north. So effective, for example, effective altruism and Peter's position is that you don't fund in the north because however much suffering there is, it's nowhere equal to the suffering of the south and you fund in the south. I have heard this from two Mexican philanthropists, okay? One of them you probably have read him saying this, and that is, they both are uh, corporate types. I pay my workers well, I provide great benefits, a great environment. This is what I'm giving to Mexico. I fund, <laughs> I fund in the South, I mean, one of them supports an entire community in Mali, in Africa. Because I can do more good with the same amount of money in Mali than I can do in Mexico. I mean, I think I hope this is somewhat of an answer to what, what, you're, what you're asking. But that kind, that is the kind of, of thinking that exists. If you take, no matter what form of the different core principles, philosophical schools you take, some form of this binary persists. Okay, if you're doing the right, the thing for the right purpose. Okay, so maybe you fund only racism. These are the kinds of decisions that end up getting made and that exacerbate tensions. So um, I would hope that a model that draws on current philosophical and ethical principles could begin. And if you have ideas, I would want them. And I welcome your involvement um, would, would be, how do you overcome this in this, in this money? Cause a lot of this is about in philanthropy, this is about philanthropy and organizations. It's about, and so there is a natural, a natural reality that the person who has the money has the power. Now, some places are coming up with some very inter interesting new models. They're very, very small places that this happens, but they have given up deciding who gets money. Somebody has to make those decisions, right? And what they, what they do is they, and you always have to start from something, I guess. They trust a few people. Let's say they're funding in Latin America. They trust a few leaders in four countries and they appoint them the people who are gonna make the decisions. It's, it, it, it's a step along the way, because then, then those people have to figure out how do they operate, which is not, do, do they not just become the old people? 
the same old white guys or the same old white women? How do you overcome some of those challenges? And people are thinking about this. Is that an okay answer? You want to push uh, me? No, no, no. Um, there's no pushing. I just, uh, I would like, to, I mean, uh, based on what you're thinking, something that just pops into my mind is um, at least trying to find ways that are less binary, basically, not to try to find those. Uh, and, and in the less binary ways, maybe that's a certain way to find uh, similarities, even within different places. And maybe that's kind of like an approach in my perspective is more like a virtue approach of empathy and solidarity, you know, that right. kind of principles um, that just make an emphasis on being similar and not on being different. And I think that's a good way of fighting against polarization. And that's kind of like a yes. thought I, I have. But Okay, I think that's good. Good first thoughts. I also, um, hmm, what was it? I also think there has to be a commitment among the parties to spend the time and the money to do this kind of work. Okay, this is not this. This is this is this is true. Truly a transformational piece of work. And transformation doesn't come cheap. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I didn't listen to that lesson. Okay, it doesn't come cheap. And so you have to be committed to spending the money, but more importantly, spending the time. Because the biggest pressure on all of us these days, and not because of COVID, is that we don't have time. You're telling me I had an NGO and you're telling me I have to go to a meeting every week for the next three months and sit with you people from the North in some way and talk about this. I can't do it. Right. Okay. Other comments, questions, ideas, building on whatever. Okay. Axel, please. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, this was great, even if quite depressing, but it's still very good. Uh, so I hope this is this helps, right? Uh, I don't, I, I don't do ethics, but I, I do some philosophy of technology, and I, I found a lot of parallelisms between some problems there, especially if you want to talk about uh, with people that come from industry and from management. Uh, you know, there's this very popular saying. Well, I think it's a Voltaire quote, I don't know, that the perfect is the enemy of the good. And I think that's a lot of what is happening here, right? Is oh. that donors are trying to make the perfect donation instead of making just good donations, right? So there, so it seems that people are just expending too much resources in trying to make things, make things that donations better, even though they were already good enough, right? And this is a distinction that it's very easy to understand, right? And this is something that is very common in investment, and especially when people are investing in technological developments. You know, there is a point in which it doesn't make sense to keep making your, your technological offer better because it's already good enough. Yeah. And just trying to keep developing, you know, more pixels or faster battery or things like that, it's actually not going to make a better product. But I think that's a way where you can talk to them in a way that they would understand if you make this, this analogy in which your product is your donation. And once it, and you, so you do want to keep away scam, uh, scam philanthropical so the organization. So you want a little bit of uh, credibility and um, I know you don't like monitoring, but at least you, you do want to avoid those kind of cases. But be anything above that, is good enough, right? Yeah. So the, 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 the motivation of why we have monitoring, why you're right, it's good to ask whether your for social change has actually any impact, is not because you want to make the best impact, the highest, that's, that just does, that's a bad idea. It is because you do want to have an impact, any impact, and not avoid falling into this philanthropical scam. So once you distinguish these two things, I think you can present the case, you can, avoid the trap of keep measuring and getting better measures and more measures and more quantity and more quantity just get the minimal necessary for the donation to do some good yeah Does, wouldn't I, that help yeah i think it would help listen 
I, I, I'll tell a little story. It's related, but not quite. I like to tell stories. Um, I have a long time relationship with the Buffett Foundation, okay, Warren Buffett. And um, when, when Mr. Buffett first got into philanthropy, he had a very clear philosophy. And his philosophy, and he's a good man, okay, he's actually a good guy. Um, his philosophy was the same as his philosophy in investing in companies. Because basically what Warren Buffett did is he bought companies, okay? It wasn't just a stock market, you know, he bought companies and he bought good companies and he bought companies that worked very well and he left them alone. And that was his philosophy. And he wanted to do the same thing in philanthropy. And for the first years, and you know, it's such an enormous amount of money. I mean, you know, at any rate, um, for the first year, he, he, um, he did, he, his son-in-law was the head of the foundation and there were maybe one or two staff people. And he gave away hundreds of millions of dollars like this. Okay. And eventually I convinced him to give me some money. Okay. It wasn't hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, but then everything changed because they decided that they had to have a staff. And they, you know, like I would write, I would write a letter and I would say, my grant is up. Do you want to give me more, another grant? And what amount are you thinking about? And I would get a letter back and it would say, yeah, we're going to keep giving you money and we're going to increase it by this amount. Send us a page, send us a two page letter. This is like for a $2 million grant. Okay. So then the foundation changed completely. All of a sudden there were all these staff people and program officers and you had to, you know, do all this reporting and, and all this, everything out and send it to 10 page proposal, et cetera, et cetera. And frankly, I didn't see better grant making. I just saw more, more bureaucracy. Okay, next person. <laughs> uh, let's take a few uh, and let me be quiet and listen to a few. Well, uh, Francis, I, I, I have lots of questions, but, but uh, okay, let me try with, with this. Um, I, I can imagine utilitarians insisting that consequences are measurable, yeah? That there's always a way to measure the consequences. If it's social transformation, yeah? If it's, if it's something related to, for instance, abortion, yeah? You, you can measure the, the way in which, I don't know, uh, uh, giving money to, to sexual and reproductive rights organizations is having an impact on 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 women going to 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 public office for instance these kind of things or even if it's if it's happiness yeah uh, they say well there is always a, a way to measure happiness and there is now a, a science of happiness mm -hmm. and, and there are there are objective ways and subjective as well, in which you know people say how happy they are, the level of satisfa of satisfaction in their lives, uh, and and so on. So, I'm listening. I, I I would like you to to say more first on okay. on what's wrong with their with the the the. the the way they they argue in favor of of measuring consequences, uh -huh. but e even even if we accept the idea of utilitarians of of measuring and commensurability, there is an issue about comparability. Yeah, in which you can say, okay. Uh, even if if consequences were measurable, 
what about com comparability? Yeah, here we have two different projects. Here we have the advancement of, of women's rights. Yeah, but uh, as, as you know, of course, some effective altruists think that uh, preventing the destruction of, of the earth, yeah, like uh, existential, doing re risk, yeah. existential risks, uh, like doing research on meteorites is also very important, it's crucial. It's probably actually more important than advancing women's rights or animal rights, or <laughs> I don't know, I can't imagine people telling you these kind of things. Yeah. yeah. So, so what, what would be your answer to the, to this issue of, of first, uh, commensurability of, of consequences being measurable, and second, to the issue of comparability of different projects, how are we going to compare them? Is it possible on what criteria, what criteria are we, are we going to use to, to compare different causes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, first of all, one of the things about uh, using a consequentialist or a utilitarian frame or effective altruism as the expression of this is that it depends upon who you're talking to as the giver. Okay. There are a lot, I think that when effective altruism concentrates on educating lousy givers, you know, people who are just throwing their money away. Okay. It serves a very good purpose. And there are a lot of people, it's, you know, this is the emotional giver versus the rational giver. There are a lot of problems with this. You can talk about these principles. You know, we could have a, a, a you know, we could do a three month seminar at the Institute on all of these various points here. But so, but then you get into people and organizations who are already doing a pretty good job at giving. I mean, does the Center for Effective Altruism think it knows better how to give away money than Bill Gates? Yes, it does. And it's wrong. Okay. Plain and simple, it's wrong. Bill Gates, he, you know, okay, you know, I like Bill Gates and I like his team, etc. Um, but he he does some things I don't like. So does Zuckerberg. But um, on the whole, they've had more impact. Bill Gates has had more impact on saving lives than the Center for Effective Altruism will have in 25 years doesn't even have the money, but that's an aside. So here's the, here's the thing, not everything, not all consequences can be, I, I disagree with this, the idea that you can figure out some form of consequence that will satisfy the utilitarian giver at some level. Well, first of all, the proof is that so far, I don't think you can do that because I don't think some things are as consequential as others. And I don't think it's easy to figure out some elements of consequence. You come with a bias, but here's the story. The organization called the life you can save, which is Peter's foundation on this has 23 effective charities that they recommend. The list is a little fuzzier than the list of GiveWell in California. GiveWell has fewer groups that meet its test for consequences. Maybe it has 19. Well, if you're gonna tell me, why haven't they figured out 50 organizations that meet the test? If you're looking for consequences, if consequences you say can be found that would be satisfactory, how come these guys haven't found them? You know, that's a consequence of their work. 
does that come close to a slight answer to the first part of your question? Or am okay. I just being very rhetorical here? No, it, it, it's all right. But now, what about the second? Com com comparability? Yeah. Okay. All right. I have said to the Center for Effective Philanthropy, uh, uh, Altruism, giving away money is both an art and a science. It is not just a science. And this is to some extent where the comparability part of this comes in. So there are, when they started, I'm concentrating on effective altruism because that was what your question is about. When they started, there was one group working on malaria that they considered worthy of their money. the Against Malaria Foundation or something like that. And, and these are bed net people. This is the bed net solution. Very measurable, etc. Over time, other organizations came to them that were doing different things on malaria. Some of them didn't come to them. Gates didn't bother to go to them. I don't know how he could have missed it. But at any rate, he does vaccines. He's looking, he's looking for a way, scientific ways to get that mosquito to stop producing whatever it is that gives malaria. And he's working on vaccines. Compar com but, but the effective altruism givers have not said, well, against the Malaria Foundation, Malaria something else, and something else, and, and the, the Gates approach. They've got their approach. Okay. So what does that say about compar comparability? The compar I think that the com being able to compare options and that your measure is which one will save the most lives, question mark. Very emotional appeal, save the most lives, by the way. But at any rate, which one will save the most lives? Well, yes, you can compare and you can see under what circumstances with X set of variables, which organization will save the most lives. And they do that, but they are human beings. You see, there is a way in which effective altruism tries to take, you know, emotion is bad. It's not bad in your personal life you, as a utilitarian, you can be loving, generous, angry, all of those things. But in your giving, your standard is to wipe emotion off the face of the earth and decide purely on consequences. Sometimes you're deciding on maybe consequences because we don't even know for sure that all consequences will happen. And here, the effective altruist, like every other human being, has a whole array of biases and pre preferences that they bring into the process because they're human beings. So, well, we started with Against Malaria Foundation and we're going to stick with our guy. Our guy's doing good. So maybe it's just as good as the other one, but we're sticking with malaria. They have their friends. We have our friends. Even utilitarians have their friends. And they do fund their friends. Their friends may not be doing the best work. Peter is round, life you can save is roundly criticized frequently for the fact that it supports Oxfam, considers Oxfam one of the premier charities. I like Oxfam, but I think there, you know, you could, you could say that by a strict, by an effective altruist person, not Peter is 
more than effective altruism. Peter, Peter is not definable. Um, you, 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 you get these, you get these biases. You know, maybe you know, like there's effective out. Peter is more like an effective altruist light. He hasn't lost his soul yet. Was that helpful, or was that just Francis talking? <laughs> It, it, it was helpful. But okay. yeah, yeah, you know, because to make a comparison, you look at a lot of things. And the problem, the, the, the other problem between this art and science bit, when you come to comparing, comp, comparing organizations that are in the same rank, okay? Because you're not going to compare, you know, the little malaria group in uh, one small place for funding, because because you are big, you want to be big, okay? Um, some philanthropists want to know the people they give money to. Eh, is that terrible? I don't know. Um, but within this frame of comparing the same things, you have to con you have to be effective altruism. Altruism does not understand the concrete value of diversity. Okay. In making comparable decisions, because given that we are all imperfect human beings with biases, feelings, bad experiences with a group, great experiences with a group, we bring those things into this decision, even if we pretend we're not bringing them in. And the protection against that is a diverse group of decision makers. And effective altruism has not yet recognized that how you do something matters not as much as what you do, but it is not irrelevant. Your processes for deciding who to give money to require, this goes back also to the question that was asked earlier, the comment earlier about Global South, Global North, et cetera. You, you, you can't just do this by reading all the studies and talking to all the white scientists at Harvard have to talk to some from Yale. Maybe you have to talk to, to some from San Francisco. But you've got to, the, the absence of this makes the comparability process very shady. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh... Or what, what, what do you think about that, Gustavo? Yeah, but here is another worry that I have about effective altruism, and, and it's about its its practical consequences. If if we're going to give money in the way these people say they, they, they say we should, aren't we going to give it to one of the, the most effective global organizations such as Greenpeace, Amnesty, uh, probably Oxfam, Planned Parenthood, these which have the, the most resources and right. the most effective ways of, of giving money. Uh, but what about the local, the local organizations? Yeah. Yes. In my case, I am Mexican and I want to give some of my money to some uh, Mexican organizations, which probably are not going to be as effective as these global organizations, yeah, and mm -hmm. and, and and we can measure the results of of what the the global organizations and the local ones, uh, the, the the consequences of what they do. And well, these people are going to tell me that that I should give my money to the the most efficient ones, yes. you know, to the big ones, the yes. global. Yeah. So what should I do? Yeah. Well, I, 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 think what you, I think what everybody should do is have a diverse portfolio of giving. 
Okay. I mean, that's what I think. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not original, but it's like every portfolio should contain 15 to 20% of risk giving. If you don't invest in risky things, you don't really make a certain kind of progress. So I think you should give, you know, so I think like, for example, Peter's idea now that he's going to give 50% to the life you can say, which is poverty funding at a high level. He's going to give 30% to the animal people and the animals. Um, okay. And then he wants to do something different with the 20%. And, you know, he, that could be climate change, which of course is not particularly local. Um, or it could actually be, take some risks, Peter. So I think that you, and, and I think that, you know, again, because of the thing that giving, I don't, there are not enough people, in my opinion, who will give totally altruistically. Giving, we, we have been taught, and this is not a bad thing. Generosity is a good thing. I want to be a more generous person than I am. Not just with money, but with kindness, with help, with, you know, not being mean, all of those kinds of things that we fall into. I want to, I want to be generous. And that's, and I think that helping people be generous, more generous than they currently are, and somewhat more effective is enough. Just do, you know, that's, that's sort, sort of it. But you know, this is like, you know, we had this guy, uh, his name is escaping me, the smallest, beautiful guy who was at Schumacher. What was his name? Uh, yeah, Peter Schumacher. Buckminster Fuller. Buckminster. Some, some Peter. Hmm? Some Peter, the economist. No, 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 no. Buckminster oh. Fuller, the the, oh. the futurist. You know. Okay. Small is small is beautiful. Effective altruists do not believe small is beautiful. It's too narrow. Uh, Aurelia Valero, please. <laughs> Thank you, Professor, um, for your talk and for letting us know about the great work you're doing with different charities around the world. Um, I think, I mean, as you said, uh, it's giving is really difficult. It's, as you said, it's, it's, it's an art and it's a science. And I guess some of the difficulties about giving is not just about being effective, but also about unintended consequences, oh, which good. sometimes have like they, they they seem to hamper. For example, even the development of economies in center in in certain countries. And I wanted to talk you, to to ask you about that about the unintended consequences of uh, giving, which is I mean, which in itself it's I know it's an act of kindness, and also if there should be any sort of accountability yes. in philanthropy? Well, there definitely should be accountability that, that if you are going to adopt as a, as a and, and, and there is a lot written about accountability. If you are going to adopt giving away money, there should be accountability. You know, I mean, that's the other thing I ask all the time to the people I interview, particularly those on the, how are you accountable? It's not easy to be accountable. In cert, I mean, it's very easy to make poor people accountable. Very easy to make people at the margins accountable. But if you hold the power, it's not so easy to make you accountable. And... Um, and so I think that, you know, part of the process in terms of the kind of work that we're talking about, which is to introduce more ethical knowledge for donors. I think that the question of 
mechanisms of accountability for the foundation. I mean, you want me to fill out this form about what I achieved? I want you to fill out a form about what you achieved in the foundation. And I want an independent body to evaluate it. And then there are other forms of accountability. Many of them are in play and some of them are honored and some of them aren't. Conflict of interest. That's an accountability mechanism. A foundation should have a conflict of interest and most of them have it, not all of them follow it. And if they're a very, very little family foundation, they don't follow it. I know a foundation, very small foundation, that paid for their executive director's master's degree. There's no accountability. But there can be. Yes, accountability is important and we need better mechanisms than we have, but we have some and we can make them better. And then the first thing, which is a much is, is, I mean, the accountability thing is not very complicated. It should be. How you make it be is if you shift the power. I mean, some foundations have tried this. Hewlett used to send around a form every year to its grantees. And Hewlett funded in Mexico for a long time, um, asking them to evaluate their relationship with the foundation. I don't know how it worked. It was by a third party that did the evaluation. And I'm sure they gave feedback to them, whether they paid attention. They didn't have to pay attention. The time that funders pay attention is when the government threatens to take their tax exemption away. <laughs> and since some governments should not be in the position of taking away people's tax exemptions, and I would say AMLO is one of those governments, um, you know, it, it can be a problem. The question around unintended consequences. Is a, it's a, is a question is, I guess, also a question of accountability. Because many of the areas that we fund in can have very severe unintended consequences. For example, there is encouragement. I know more about reproduction, so I tend to talk about that more. But in climate change, there are a number of very serious possible unintended consequences and that where it would be that. And so that two things are important. One is just as in many areas, we require prior investigation before money is spent on what possible unintended consequences should exist. And these, this work is done by professional teams. Okay. So there's that. The second thing is when an unintended consequence occurs, that the appropriate ethical responses happen. One, the people who experience the, un or villages or countries that experience the unintended consequences should be compensated for the damage done to them by the donor. And there should be public acknowledgement that bad things happen. We try to do this with pharmaceutical companies, right? Because they basically give us phony studies. Not all of them, not all of the time, but we know what happens. So those kinds of mechanisms should be in place and there need to be, it's not a bad idea for there to be more investigative bodies that investigate the money that's given away. For example, there are donors who encourage and fund uh, the performance of illegal abortions in various countries. This is a good thing, if you ask my opinion. Because in many countries, abortion is illegal. And the only way women are going to get abortions is to foster safe 
illegal abortions. It's possible. What happens when the doctor gets arrested? Where is the accountability on the part of the foundation that encouraged and funded that work? And now the guy's in jail. More likely a woman. But at any rate, do they have a fund? I mean, I've talked to funders about this. They, you, have to have a, you have to have a legal fund. You can do this. I'm glad you're doing it. But you need a legal fund. Things like that. That's my answer for now. Oh, our time is almost up. I could do this forever. Okay. Is there any other question? If, if not, I, if, if I may ask a, a last question, uh, given the current situation in, in Mexico. As, as you know, uh, foundations stop giving money to Mexican NGOs yes, for the course. last few, few years. Of course. Basically because nothing was happening, because they, they, they were giving money and they, they didn't see any results. Yeah. Right. So yesterday abortion was decriminalized in Mexico. Do, do you see uh, some of these foundations uh, giving money again to, to some of these organizations? This is, this is not, I think this is the, the, possibly yes. They will give, if they give, they will give for training healthcare professionals to do abortions, okay? Which is done, as we know, by EPAS, but they don't have to be the only people that do this. And it will no longer be clandestine so that it can also be accountable. How many doctors did you train and how many abortions are they doing? Okay, but it will be legal. So I think there would be could be money for that. I think that the question of whether they will support clinics, opening clinics, it depends. I think helping public hospitals gear up to provide abortion services would be something that would be considered. Helping private individuals open their own private clinic is not likely, even though it may be a very important strategy because we know that those clinics make money. So they should, should they be seen as profit-making investments? I, I have had a long time aspiration in Mexico to open the Holy Family Abortion Clinic. Anybody who wants to finance it, I'll be happy to take your money. <laughs> well, probably people from Catolicas. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. Nobody will do that. It's a, you know, it's like, I, even I probably wouldn't do it in the end, but um, yeah, but no, I mean, yes, I think there is some chance, but the donor community has significantly left Mexico. The donor community has significantly left Latin America. They haven't left completely. And there are countries where the donor, but you know, like Mexico is no longer an, what the bank, the World Bank classifies as an LDC, lower development country. And so even though governments don't talk about effective altruism in, or the greatest good for the greatest number, in essence, they follow, they, 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 they follow the, greatest, the greatest number in a sense. So the greatest need the greatest need is in Africa for everything, for everything. Yeah, and right. the donors have migrated. Well, but hopefully they'll come back. Maybe. Here to oh, yeah. 
sure, I'm sure we will all try to get them back. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'll just say this sort of like a last remark. And this is this question I raised in the, in the slides about what are you trying to accomplish? Okay, what's your, what's your core principle? Okay. And there are two of them that, uh, that I've been talking about a lot lately that are in conflict. Some people say they're not really in conflict, but I think they're wrong. One is the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And the other is serving the most marginalized. Okay. These are not the same thing. And these come from these, these principles are rooted in different ways in different people. Okay. And so is the principle serving the most marginalized more, I don't have an answer, ser, more important than, than, than doing the greatest good for the greatest number of people. It's a very difficult calculation, but the question is for this philosophy stuff is, is that not the contribution that philosophers and ethicists should be making to the discourse in philanthropy? Can philosophers and ethicists make an impact on philanthropy? And there are some that are doing it. I, you will get from Gustavo the list of um, the, the, the recent books that have been published by philosophers on philanthropy. Some philosophers are paying attention to this field. And the Institute could certainly be one of those. Hopefully. Okay. Well, why not? <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, it's time to bring this to an end. This has been a great seminar. Thank you very much for, for bringing this topic to our attention and for the, for the discussion. Yeah. Uh, I, I just want to remind people that now, uh, uh, it's it's time for the presentation of of the new institute's postdocs, yeah. So, well, Francis, if, if it has been a pleasure, if you want to stay, you're welcome to stay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. But please, so anybody who wants to talk to me, you can see that I'm accessible as a personality, and I have an email. So. Yeah, and then Francis is going to be teaching in in the next semesters at the postgrado uh, de filosofía. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank well, you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.